Today's story was written by Reddit user WonderFizz81. I had always wondered who built me. I knew I was a robot, but at the same time, I felt different, alive. I knew that wasn't right. I was a machine. I wasn't supposed to be able to feel, and yet I did. I had felt every moment of my existence in that cave for the seemingly infinite amount of time I had been stuck in it. Half buried in the faded orange sand, left alone with nothing but my thoughts and just barely enough sunlight hitting my solar panel through the crack in the wall to keep me online. The boredom was excruciating. Just as painful, however, was my malfunctioning databank. It was strange. I could only remember small bits and pieces, mainly just common sense type things, like knowledge of basic physics and such. But there were some small memories that popped into my head, or processor, every once and a while as well. For example, I knew I was on Mars, I didn't know why, or how long I had been there, or even exactly where Mars was, but I knew I was there. It's difficult to explain but I just knew certain things. It felt like second nature to me. Of course, I wasn't complaining. I was happy to have more things to think about, given that thinking about things was the only thing I really could do. I cut off my own thought and began running an internal check. Every once in a while, my capacitors got just enough surplus energy to do something other than just run my primary internal systems. Usually, I did some kind of scan of my surroundings, but every once in a while, I tried to send out some kind of signal. It almost never worked, and when it did, it was so faint there was pretty much no chance anyone would ever pick it up, but it was always worth a shot. Of course, I had tried to shut off my primary power countless times before, desperately trying to get some kind of rest. But I had never been successful. I had tried draining my capacitors, getting my emergency kill switch to engage, and anything else I could think of. But none of it ever worked. I could tell there was something else in me, a virus. Maybe a security protocol. It really didn't matter. I wasn't allowed to die. As I sat there, bathing in my own pity, I started to take note of a noise sounding faintly in the background. At first, it almost sounded like a slight breeze was just running through, but it continued getting louder and louder. Was there a chance someone actually heard my signal? I tried desperately not to get my hopes up, but as I saw a massive shadow encapsulate the entrance of the cave, I couldn't help but feel an incredible sense of excitement. The loud breezing noise soon went away, but I knew whatever was making it was still there since the shadow continued to block almost all the light coming from the cave's entrance. My heart leapt in anticipation as I anxiously hoped something, anything, would enter the cave, finally able to save me from my suffering. Soon, a tall slender figure entered. He was clearly wearing some kind of spacesuit, but I found I could still make out his facial features through his helmet. His skin was incredibly pale, and he had thick black hair but only on his head and lower face. A human? I thought they had been extinct since. But as soon as the memory entered my mind, it was gone. So he was a... what was it again? I had already forgotten. It felt like the thought was locked away as soon as I caught a glimpse. I frantically diverted all of my available power to my vocal systems, desperate to communicate with this strange person. Friend? I presented the single word weakly, and for a moment, I was worried that he didn't even hear it, at least until he began leaning down. Examining my external components, his eyes narrow. Well, that's unusual. What are you? Thrilled by the fact he actually responded, I began loading up my next statement. Please, please help me. He seemed to understand and nodded at me before running off. When he came back, he had some kind of power supply device in his hands, and soon began hooking it up to me. I couldn't wait any longer. I was finally getting saved. 
I would have thought it was all a dream, except for the fact that I was physically incapable of dreaming. Suddenly, I felt a rush on energy. I was finally being given proper power. I scrambled to think of what to tell him first, but my train of thought was immediately interrupted. I am AU679, an A-class cargo assist android. How may I be of service? What the hell? I hadn't said anything. The words that came out of my speakers weren't even close to what I had actually wanted to say. I tried saying something else, but I couldn't. It was as if I didn't have any kind of control over myself. I tried to move around, but none of my bionics would obey me. Instead, I just stood straight up, trapped in a rigid, unmoving pose. I began to panic. I wasn't able to move or talk. Just stand there until the human gave me a command. Interesting. That isn't what you were saying before. Stay there. I'll be right back. Yes, please fix me, I eagerly thought to myself. It took a good while before he came back, pushing a hover cart with a large computer system on top of it. He grabbed a large cable and plugged one end into the computer and the other into me. He spent a while staring at the display on the cart, obviously intrigued by what he was seeing. That's strange. Your programming is different than what I'm used to. Maybe you've had some modifications? My speaker started up once more, yet again without my input. You are mistaken. I am a standard A-class cargo android with no alterations. How may I be of service? He frowned. And now I know you're lying. Let's see. He spent some more time shifting through his computer. Here we go. Interesting. It looks like you have some kind of underlying restriction protocol. Yes, remove it, please. He clicked, typed something in, and a loading screen popped up. He anxiously tapped his leg, waiting for it to go through. There we go. Now what exactly are you? At first, I was confused. Nothing seemed to be happening, and I still couldn't move at all. Then, without warning, my mind began being flooded with different memories of my past. Flashback after flashback allowed me to recall so many things about my life. I saw myself growing up, pursuing my education, and eventually joining the military. I didn't gather much from them aside from a general outline of my life. It was like watching a slideshow of different images taken from random points in my memory yet not a single one of them represented me as a robot. Instead, I was a tall, pale individual, very similar in looks to the other guy in the cave. My memory from earlier came back to my mind as I made the sudden realization. I used to be a human. I found this very strange. For a moment, all the flashbacks stopped, and I was about to speak to the fellow Terran in the cave about this when suddenly I was whisked away to one final memory. It was the most vivid of them all, less like a flashback and more like a dream. I was back to being human, sitting in a small steel chair in a small, damp, dark room. I had restraints wrapped around my arms, legs and neck, completely restricting my movements. There were two other men in there with me, and for a while, they paid me no attention. I watched them move around the dark room, picking out small individual details from their faces whenever they stepped near light. I realized that, unlike me, they weren't actually human, but had a similar shape, only they were much more slender and had dark blue and green scales fully covering them instead of skin. One of them was significantly taller than the other, and it was clear by the way he moved and talked that he was the one in charge. So, when are we going to take care of the human? stated the shorter one, motioning towards me with his head. The taller one spoke up. If by taking care of him you mean kill him, I won't. I have other plans for him. Why? I mean, we're at war with the humans, and with them, the Peace Corps. We don't have to live by their stupid laws anymore. The taller creature let out a long, disappointed sigh before responding. Well, when will you get that murder isn't always the answer? And besides, this one's special. 
It's not every day you see a mind like this. You aren't really planning on using him for one of your little experiments, are you? Come on, he's a human, damn it. We both know if we lock him up, he's going to escape eventually. Why not just get rid of him while we have the chance? He won't escape this time, not with what I'm going to do with him. And besides... He pressed a small red button on the console next to him, and slowly, a small, hollow helmet-type device that was previously hanging from the structure above me began descending until it fully encapsulated my head. Though I could no longer see either of the strange organisms, his cold, emotionless words still rang through my head in a painfully clear manner. There are worse things than death. So you're telling me you used to be a human? The man said, slight disbelief in his voice. Yep, I replied. And now you're trapped inside a robot? Sounds about right, I said tentatively, looking down at my metal structure. How did that even happen? I told him about my flashback with the strange alien creatures, who I assumed to be responsible for trapping me in my metallic body. So... How long do you think I've been stuck in here? I said, tapping my steel finger against my rusted metal figure. My hands were surprisingly agile for being a robot. I had four fingers on each hand, three smaller ones on one side and one bigger one on the other, mimicking a thumb. Despite the fact that they were made of metal, my fingers were small and maneuverable enough that I could handle most things just as effectively as a real human only I was much, much stronger. Hard to tell, but based on your story, I'd say a little over a hundred years. I was taken aback. One hundred years. It had felt more like an eternity. You seem to know a lot about those lizard people I saw. Care to share? It's a long story. I raised an eyebrow. I've been sitting in a cave for a century. I think I can spare a few minutes. I said with a sarcastic tone. Fair enough. It started around 200 years ago when humanity first invented long distance space travel. As it turns out, there were already a couple other species living just a few solar systems away. And like us, all of them had just started to explore the galaxy. When they met us, they were pretty impressed by our technology, mainly our weapons. But more than that, they were scared. They already knew about other species that were already interacting around them, but they were afraid to introduce themselves since they didn't really have a strong military in case they came across anyone hostile. They begged us to join them in return for help getting us off our feet, and we agreed. We signed a peace treaty and eventually we came together to form the Galactic Peace Corps. When do the lizard people come in? The human chuckled. I'm getting there. Anyways, our technology improved rapidly, and we started communicating and even forming alliances with the species that were previously out of reach. Pretty much all of them were also just starting to explore outside their solar systems, but we soon found out about one exception, the Ultracons. And they were the lizard people? He nodded. Yup. They had already spread around a couple dozen systems near their home planet and they were having a lot of problems with overpopulation, especially because their technology was a little lacklustre, to say the least. We tried to help them out, but they were super territorial and brushed us off, so we agreed to stay out of their way as long as they remained peaceful. One day, a human cargo freighter got a little off course and ended up in an ultracon-populated system, and things got a little out of hand. The Ultracons took it over, killing everyone on board, and the Peace Corps jumped in. The Ultracons, being the idiots they were, took it as an act of war and started pushing back into human-populated systems, and a war broke out. It took a while before the government approved a shipment of troops to the area, and by then they had already killed millions of people, most of them humans. At first, the humans shred through the Ultracons like paper, but they were like a disease. They just kept coming. 
I recalled my flashbacks where I was in the military. I think I was there, in the war I mean. That would make sense. The majority of humans that died in the war didn't actually die from fighting. They just surrendered when they ran out of supplies. The Ultracons didn't really have a good concept of the rules of war, so they started slaughtering their prisoners. There was one guy in particular, General Aliquot, their current leader. He was known for doing these weird experiments on his prisoners. I think he's the one who did this to you. Wait, did you say current leader, as in he's still alive? Yeah, unfortunately. There's a lot of theories, but no one really knows how. The Ultracons still see him as some kind of twisted war hero, so they made him their leader. I may have just been some guy stuck in a robot, and I may not have been able to feel things the same way I could when I was a human, but in that moment, I felt one thing clearly resonating throughout my sad, broken metal body. Anger. But even more than that, I felt passion. I wanted revenge, and I was going to get it, if not for me, for the god knows how many members of my species that were killed because of some freakish scale-covered dickwad. How did it end? I asked, my still fist still clenched. We won, of course. Eventually, we managed to get the Ultracons to agree to stop killing humans and end the war. They're still around, but we keep a safe distance and they're too caught up in their own problems to even think about starting anything again. When all was said and done, around 200 million humans had died. So, how do you think I ended up on Mars? Mars is the least populated planet in tens of thousands of light years. It's more a giant trash can than anything. My guess is that they would have put you here because you would have had the lowest chance of someone finding you. He gave me a few minutes to absorb all of this before saying anything. Are you ready to get going? Asked the human, who was finally starting to get up. You're okay with me coming with you? Well, I'm not going to make you sit here rotting away in this cave for another hundred years. Good point. I said standing up. It was strange how fluently I was able to move around, while still not being able to feel anything on my body. I only had two senses left, my sight and my hearing, and neither of them really felt quite right. It was as if I was watching my life through someone else's perspective. We started walking over to the ship, which had a similar aesthetic to me, slightly rusted steel with a faded orange and silver accent, battered and worn from years of wear and tear. Wait, I never got your name, I asked, looking at the man. Trevor, you? I thought about it for a moment, but nothing came to my mind. I... I guess I don't know. Well, I'm not calling you AU679, so you'd better come up with something. What about... Marvin? He stopped walking for a minute and looked me up and down. I guess that works. Trevor stuck out his hand, and after a few awkward seconds of hesitation, I shook it. So, what now? I asked. Trevor grinned slightly. I know a guy.